Hi guys. Okay, this is the second part of break even. So let's close this. <clears throat> so a couple of things. So we have discussed um, break even from a mathematical point of view. Looked at the graphs. So I'm going to go to your textbook now, which you please um, need to go to because I'm speaking from there. So I'm on page 382. So let's look at the uses of break even. Um, and you want to know this because this even helps your general um, analysis and evaluation. Um, because we just don't quite know what they what questions they will ask. It's the first year, but they want to know that you can express your knowledge, and you can always suppose. And I mentioned this. I'll write that again. You can always um, suppose. There's no problem with supposing. Okay. So um, page three hundred and eighty-two of your textbook. Yeah, you can pause this so you can get there. Page three hundred eighty-two talks about. Um, well, leading into page 383, talks about a couple of uses of break even. And of course, like I said, one of the main objectives of every business, one of the main objectives of a business is survival. So when a business is starting off, just before, just as it's beginning to start, and um, you're trying to create some kind of a plan, something you have in your mind is how much, how many units will I need to sell in order to cover? my fixed cost. You see, and the reason why you're concerned about this is because generally um, you have some control over your variable cost. When I say some control in terms of efficiency, imagine you're making a cake, you can think do I add more, do I add less, I can manage that. Um, you still have to pay that cost, of course. But with the fixed cost, if you have a landlord who's threatening you and who can shut your business down, that's your, your it's almost like a, there's a fear of fixed costs right because if you if you um, don't uphold or stick to your payments um, you could lose your entire business so that's one of the reasons uh, why break even is a good is a good idea um, I'll just write here revenue so I don't forget what I want to say there um, now when if, then the next um, the next point in your textbook on page 382 talks about when uh, making changes when making changes within the business. Now, the issue here is when making changes within the business, because you clearly know what the variable costs are, you know what the direct materials are, you know what the direct labor is, you know what the fixed costs are, you know what the variable costs are, because you have this type of information, um, you can start to adjust or play with things. So you can think, do I move? Do I find a cheaper place? Um, do I increase my selling price? Do I use more of a certain material? So you can actually adjust or better control, if you like, the, the costs that you're dealing with. I mean, the issue here is that you are in the know. You know you have a breakdown of, of what's actually causing you costs, variable, and um, you can change, do I change supplier? I don't know. The, the key point really is, is that you have a better understanding of what's, of what's going on. Um, well, of course, we want to always know what's going on with profit. I've mentioned this before. Here's the thing. If you're, let's go back to our portion of chips that we talked about in the earlier video. If you're selling for 20 and it's costing you 10, and you're making 10 as contribution. Well, once you sell 100 portions, you have made a contribution of 1,000. Once you cover your fixed costs, well, you're done. So from a hundred, the hundredth and one portion of chips will simply be 20 minus 10, because you still have to make it, so you have 10. That contribution of 10 is all profit, and it's all profit, because you don't have to think um, about that fixed cost anymore, as in from the hundred and one, and then hundred and two, and the same thing. So the key point here is that we can also use it as a means of working our profit. Um, once we've covered our fixed costs, all contribution is profit. We can ask what if questions. We can ask what if selling price falls. What if we're not able to sell? What if, <clears throat> for all the reasons we talked about yesterday, we have a pestle scenario? if you like, for business students, or if you like um, a change in demand for econ students. Oops, sorry, for econ students. Sorry, what if you have that? I mean, for whatever reason. So the key point is, because we have a graph that's keeping us um, aware of what's going on, then we're able to, to, make, to make decisions, to make decisions. Remember, decision-making, one of our big reasons for budgeting. 
And then we can look at alternatives and look at different ways, if you like, do we get more machines to come in so we can reduce the cost of labor, if you like, um, do we find new, do we have to find new customers? Key point really is that we're looking for options because we have a breakdown of what's going on, right? In fact, you even up to the decision of is it worth it? Is it worth it? Whoops, again, this keeps, this keeps jumping, forgive me. Is it worth it? Right? Is it worth it? Okay. Now, I think, let's talk talk about this within the limitations of, of break-even. So let's talk about the limitations of break-even. One, one of the issues I want to talk about here is to do with this issue of analysis. If, for example, you were asked to do any kind of analysis that, to do with break-even, even if you, because if you have 20 mark and you're asked to do some break-even work, you do everything, and you're asked to discuss the limitations or whatever, here's the thing. Like I said earlier on about gross profit margin, break-even assumes a couple of things, that you're only selling, or you can only really do break-even for one product. So the key point here is that whenever you do any break-even analysis or you have something that says 1,000 units, it must just be for one product. So that's the limitation um, in itself. Um, and we should be able to analyze and work out what the break-even would be for certain products. Or we should be able to sort of say, and think about this carefully, look at this. I should be able to argue that, you know what, I will use, imagine I'm selling a range of products. So let's go to a restaurant. In the restaurant, we'll have an alcohol, the bar, and we'll have the tables. Now, why is it impossible for the restaurant owner to say, I will use the alcohol sales to cover my fixed costs? So, for example, let's stick with the same idea. Let's say his rent is a thousand pounds, and each bottle of wine costs him ten pounds, and he can sell it for twenty. So he knows that okay, as soon as I sell a hundred bottles of wine, I have covered my fixed costs. And here's the thing: everything else he sells in the shop will pretty much have nothing to do with fixed costs because he's already. He's already separated one product to focus on his fixed costs. So he's now said, okay, you know what, we'll sell food. I don't know, say the sale, we sell the food at um, eight pounds, then it's cost us four. So we're making four of contribution. All of this four is profit. So the key point is, he now allows himself to, to play around with this selling price because he knows all I have to cover, all I have to focus in the food section is making sure I cover my variable costs, right? And all I have to think about is what's the cost of actually making the food. And then I'll just focus and try and manipulate the selling price, give a discount, maybe give some free food. I don't know. But the key point is that he is the key point is the break even analysis allows us to make these type of decisions, right? Um, because it allows us to, to, to look at different options and think, okay, you know what? I'll use one product, cover my fixed cost. So you can suppose this, you can suppose this sort of thing. You can think like this, and we need to be thinking like this in this in this new in this under this new, if you like, um, syllabus. Okay, right, so let's look at what they believe the limitations are um, for. All right, I haven't helped because I have. Uh, let me just do that. Let's get, get, get this clean again. And let's look at the, the main limitations. Oh, I have two minutes. So, what are the limitations of break even? So, the limitations are first of all, these, these relationships are never constant. You and I know that costs are never fixed. In fact, you and I know that pricing is never the same. So, first of all, we have this idea of the constant. Nothing is ever constant. Maybe fixed costs at best, I will accept. But you know that prices, the theory of demand, the theory of, the theory of demand says that as you sell more, you will have to reduce your price in terms of quantity demanded, right? We know that. And we know that, if you like, the, the, the costs in themselves, we, we, this is where you can now start really putting in, well, putting in some of your ideas in terms of you have discounts, you might be able to get them for cheaper, um, if, you want, uh, if you want more. Let's just focus on labor, for example. Let's look at a labor cost. When you start making a product, you probably will pay the person more for the product, uh, pay the worker more. Wages will probably be quite high because the worker is taking longer. But as the worker gets better, um, if you like, so if you like, if this is the cost going quite up as I'm making my units, so these are my units, and that's the cost going quite, the cost starts to thin out a little because the worker gets faster. So the worker is spending less time on making the unit. So it's actually spending less time. And at a certain point, the worker gets faster and faster. So it's, say if the worker was spending two minutes to make the first unit, he probably will spend one and a half. 
to make the second unit, and then he'll spend one to make the third unit. So we, if you like, let's refer to it as a learning curve. The person's pretty clever and he's knowing what's going on. So the truth is that the key point here, but at some point, you probably the worker will probably start asking for holiday and I'll start asking for a pay rise or start asking for, um, if you like, overtime. So the key point is that we know that costs do vary. So that's the first problem with this idea. And like I said, sale prices will vary at different points because you're constantly trying to apply different str I've gone over my 10 minutes. I'll quickly tie this up. Sale, sale prices are constantly changing um, because of whatever reason, discounts in the, in the markets. I've talked about variable costs. Um, fixed costs, we've talked about extra premises that might be needed. So the truth is that um, break-even only will last for a certain number of units. And these are all assumptions. We have assumed that we can actually sell these units and that they will sell. Um, and external factors, we have completely pretended that there are no shocks to this system. So we've just said we'll just be happily selling away. So you can see break-even really is telling us that if you have a steady market, steady product, um, steady environment, um, constant revenue, constant fixed costs, then break-even makes sense. But the other issue is if you're selling many products, you can't have break-even for all the products together. You have to have break-even for every individual product if you like, in your in your possession or in your shop um, for it to make any sense. You can have an average break-even, but what does that really mean? You want to see individual break-even for individual products. Okay, great stuff. I'm over by our <laughs> 30 minutes. So that ends and that concludes the chapter on break-even. For homework, I want you to do... I don't have the slides that Leslie has, so I want you to do... The, they're not many, actually. There's... um. There's only um, there's la 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 there's eight questions at the back of the book, uh, so ba basically at uh, the back of that chapter. So I want you to go to page three hundred. Oops, yeah, page uh, page three hundred and eighty-six, three hundred and eighty-six, and to page three hundred and eighty. Nine. I want you to do those questions. Critical. Make sure you do those questions so you're comfortable with what's going on, right? And um, email email your answers to me um, on Monday. Um, here's my email address. I will email you anyway. I'll email you this. So I want my this this homework um, on Monday. Say uh, if you like Monday, late Monday. If you like Monday, anytime on Monday in the evening. Just let me know what you've done. Okay, great stuff. Thank you. See you in the next video.